Okay, great. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to the 12th session of the Ideas Conclave. Um, hosted by the University of Central Punjab, titled Pakistan's Climate Crisis. My name is Asif Nawaz Shah. I'm an urban and uh, climate policy analyst currently based out of Dubai, but originally from Lahore, and I will be moderating this panel. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce our esteemed panelists for the session. Firstly, uh, Ahmed Rafi Alam, who I'm sure you all are well aware of. He's an environmental lawyer and partner at Salim Alam & Co, a law firm specializing in the energy, water, natural resources, and urban infrastructure sectors. He's also a Yale World Fellow and currently serves as a member of the Pakistan Climate Change Council and the Punjab Environment Protection Council as advisor to Air Quality Asia and as a member of the Hisar Foundation think tank on the rational use of water. Um, secondly, we have Rimal Muyuddin, who is the South Asia campaigner at Amnesty International. Uh, and she works on prisoner rights, the right to health, and the climate crisis. And uh, last but not least, we have Tabitha Spence, uh, who's a geographer focused on climate politics with degrees from the University of Texas and the University of Arizona. Uh, she took part in the people's mobilizations in Paris during um, COP21 and continues to be active with youth and trade unions for a just transition to an anti-colonial global Green New Deal. She's also a Lahore-based member of Hakuke Khalk movement, uh, is part of the Democratic Socialists of America, is active with Asia Europe People's Forum and part of Progressives International. Thank you all very, very much for agreeing to be a part of this discussion and making yourselves available. I'm personally very excited as well because I think these kinds of discussions add a lot of value to public discourse around climate policy, especially amongst the youth. Um, so it's great to be here and a huge thank you to Reza and his team for organizing this session around this very important topic. Thanks, guys. So uh, let's just get into it. Um, a brief and relatively simplistic overview of the, what the global climate crisis is. Uh, our world is already warming. It's warmed by around 0 0.8 to 1.2 degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial levels. And uh, many are saying that the 1.5 degree target for warming, ma uh, maximum target for warming recommended by the Paris Agreement of 2015, which was the Global Climate Accord signed in 2015, is also slipping out of reach unless we see serious acceleration of action by major emitters around the world. Um, while these major emitters are generally concentrated in the developed global north, many of the most adverse effects of this warming will be and indeed are already being felt most strongly here in the global south. Climate hazards such as intensifying rainfall, flooding as we've seen in the past few months, food and water insecurity, climate induced migration, as well as uh, a crisis that we're all very well acquainted with coming from Pakistan, um, the air quality and smog crisis, which also has a link to climate change. So with that in mind, uh, I'm going to bring in our panelists. And my first question to them is to really take stock of where we are now in Pakistan. How do we define Pakistan's climate crisis and, and how must a country like Pakistan uh, develop its priorities and, and response? Rafi, um, if you want to kick things off, that would be great. Um, well, thank you, Asif. Uh, it's really a pleasure uh, to be invited to speak on climate policy and also to be part of a panel with Rimmel and Tabby. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, the climate crisis is bad, as you already mentioned. Uh, uh, we're at 1.1, 1.2 degrees of, of temperature warming, and already uh, oceans are acidifying coral reefs are dying, uh, we're facing a sixth extinction event. Uh, there are forest fires in Australia, in California, in the Arctic, uh, and there are plastics in our bodies. There is no safe amount of climate change. These numbers uh, that Kyoto and the Paris Agreement put forward of two degrees and one and a half degrees aren't threshold levels that once tripped will cause climate catastrophe. Uh, no. Uh, there should be understood to be the politically acceptable amount of damage governments are willing to bear. Uh, and so we have to ask ourselves, uh, are we willing to bear this damage? The difference between a degree and a half and two degrees of warming has been assessed to be uh, the cost of about 150 million lives, mostly lost in Asian and African cities on account of air pollution associated with greenhouse gas emissions. 
those are the types of costs uh, that we're looking at. If we look at the policy position here in Pakistan, uh, I can sort of characterize three consistent policy positions we've had to the climate crisis. Uh, the first is that we are a signatory to the UNFCCC Kyoto Protocol in Paris, and that we comply with all our obligations under these agreements. The second is that we are a small net greenhouse gas emitter, and really the problem is the developed countries of the global north who have to discharge their responsibility of mitigation on account of their uh, historical greenhouse gas emissions. And the third is that we don't have the money uh, to put in systems of mitigation and adaptation that would uh, provide resilience and protection against future climate events. Uh, against these sort of consistent policy positions, the present government has uh, uh, initiated, for example, an upgrade of the fuels that are available in Pakistan. Uh, we now can get Euro 5 standard fuel, although this is not mandatory to automobiles yet. Uh, it's just one of the fuels that's available. There's also the... Uh, electric vehicle policy that the federal government has launched, which is another aim to reduce uh, carbon emissions. And then there's the 10 billion and 1 billion tree tsunamis. However, if you take all of these policy positions and initiatives together, uh, it's my opinion, it still doesn't take into account the gravity of the present climate situation. It still presumes, for example, that Pakistan being a signatory, Pakistan falling into line, uh, Pakistan planting these billion trees will somehow mean that the world will still meet its targets under Paris or Kyoto. When we know in reality that it would require unprecedented technological and economic revolutions to be able to keep global temperatures to about 2.12 degrees by the end of this century. Uh, so we just don't see the gravity of the situation and we hide behind these policy positions and try and pass the buck off to somebody else. Great. Uh, thank you, Rafi. Uh, so one point under that that you mentioned was this, this position that we have that we're a low emitter state, that our responsibility isn't as great in mitigating emissions. Um, but like you said, given that we're already hitting a degree of warming that is not safe for human life to flourish. Um, can we really afford that kind of response to the, the climate crisis? And I want to bring uh, Rimmel, here, Rimmel here as well uh, to talk about the human rights and humanitarian cost of this kind of policy and action in the global south. Um, what how would you ca characterize that and what is needed to move beyond that kind of discussion of the climate crisis? Thank you. Thank you, Asif. And it's always such a treat to hear from Rafa. It's like a, it's like a complete, you, it's the best way to understand the way that the country is uh, approaching climate change. Um, to add to what Rafa was saying, I think it's definitely a huge issue that what policymakers, it's definitely a, a fig leaf that they hide behind, which is when they say, hang on, like, we didn't do, we didn't cause this problem, we don't have the money, and it's served as this excuse for a very long time. And like, frankly, of course, rich countries have a responsibility, of course, they have the means to it. And in fact, one of the biggest, one of the, you know, overlooked responsibilities of, of, of the global north is that they have defined what can and can't be done for climate change. They're the ones who define the parameters of what climate action can be. They're the ones who say that it costs too much. If it's costing everybody so much, if nobody has the resources for it, and yet we always find it within us and within our budgets to have to subsidize fossil fuels. And we always have money to invest in things that we that are actually destroying the climate. That's something that, again, that cover needs to be exposed for what it is, which is just an excuse. And it even and frank and you know frankly, even if Pakistan doesn't have the money, in order for that narrative that they're pushing that we just we don't we didn't emit anything we didn't cause the climate crisis so we shouldn't be held responsible and we should be held to a different standard, that advocacy won't work without credibility. If Pakistan is continuously investing in coal power plants and it's celebrating those coal power plants as a way to mitigate the power crisis in the country, then it's not really uh, with what sort of um, credibility is it going to go to the global north and say, hang on, you need to give us more money. You need to give us more support because we're still investing in everything. And 
granted we have these issues and we do have to focus on this but that kind of shift in priority is what's actually important to move to economies that are not exploitative that are not unsafe and that are rights respecting and as to the second part of your question about the human rights um, element of course the climate crisis is a human rights crisis it's there's no two ways about it and i think it's really important to start looking at it as such and framing it as such, uh, framing it in a way that's not that you know isn't so focused on deadlines because deadlines can be alienating and give people tunnel vision and make them feel like the problem is bigger than them and so desensitize them it's important to sort of look at and with deadlines it also you know ironically has this effect of making it seem like a future problem whereas for pakistanis it has very much been it, it's something that we're living every day we're experiencing it every day it's not a future problem it's not something that's going to happen in 10 years 15 years once we hit that trigger point as rafi said that that trigger point um we're it, we're going to once we cross that that's when it starts to happen no it's absolutely not going to happen and 2020 is the biggest example of the culmination of the decisions that have been made by the human race and that's exactly how the climate crisis is, has been hitting us for so long and unfortunately the people that are on the front lines the people who are actually being affected by it are not the ones who are being represented in these decisions they're not the ones sitting on having these panel discussions and speaking to people they're not the voices that are being put forward so this sort of idea that it's it's a future problem that also feeds into the um the procrastination that states rely on and it's always something that's for the next government to solve and unfortunately um that uh, we need to reshift the focus to on the urgency of helping people here and now it's not something that's going to happen in the in the future absolutely um i think that's really important it's it's not something that's down the line it's happening now and it's impacting people on the front line as we speak uh, so they can't really afford inaction thanks rimal um tabby to sort of uh, bring in a point rimal raised and a point that rafi raised which is that if we don't have the money how can the international sort of agreements that we are party to how can we leverage those effectively and this is something rimal already touched upon showing good faith action on climate uh, not investing in things like coal which is actually also a part of the first indc that pakistan submitted to the unfcc uh, increasing coal efficiency how do we demonstrate to the international climate finance system uh, that investing in pakistan's climate action future is a worthwhile investment Well, I think Remo really hit the nail on the head when she talked about how countries like Pakistan are looking to the global north and the wealthy countries and China which has grown so fast, uh which seems as a model in a way when thinking about how to tackle this crisis. And when those countries are taking completely the wrong approach by continuing to invest in coal, by, you know, I mean we have seen Trump withdraw the United States historically the largest polluter in the world from the Paris agreement you know it's it's uh it it's hard to expect uh you know other countries around the world to to act in good faith and i think what we're experiencing is a race to the bottom because the idea is not uh, about meeting basic human needs today globally uh in extending the kind of international solidarity that's required to do that in terms of finance and in terms of technology transfers and in terms of other types of support um instead what we uh, are dealing with is an extraordinarily extractive global economy and that global economic system is the crisis itself it it it, it has been referred to as the crisis it has been referred to as the virus and here i i do want to link the climate crisis to the pandemic because both of these are symptoms of this global economic system um i mean not a lot of people realize this but the pandemic it, itself was predicted the public health community has been saying for years that we were due for a pandemic and that's largely because we continue destroying ecosystems around the world and um when different uh species 
find themselves in human environments because their own habitats have been destroyed, the opportunity for pathogens to leap from one species to another massively increase. And that's what happened here with this COVID-19 virus. Um, what we're seeing now with the melting of the ice caps is not only um, the emergence of all kinds of interesting artifacts, which you may have seen, you know, referred to in National Geographic and elsewhere, but it's also leading to the emergence of, of new, path, actually old, very old pathogens resurfacing. And so we are very likely to see more pandemics or epidemics at the least uh, circulating the globe. And, um, and then we have to think about also how the um, global circulation networks are contributing to this crisis. Uh, to both of these crises. Um, fossil fuels are a key part of the crisis. That's not to say that we should become isolationists, which people like Donald Trump wanted in the United States, for instance, but it does mean we really need to rethink how we move, how we circulate goods, how we move people. And that really links back to the question of finance that you raised in the beginning. Because, you know, if uh, certain essential goods are not available in particular places um, because of sanctions or because of the way the international financial system works, um, you know, of course, there's going to be a need uh, to, to push for certain kinds of flows, but we see those flows as extractive, the, the commodity flows as extractive, the, the, uh, the flows of finance as extractive, um, and, you know, here in Pakistan, I recently heard the statistic, you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, but that 40% of Pakistan's budget is going to banks. Many of those banks are international financial institutions. If Pakistan had that 40% of their own budget available to put toward the health epidemic, to put toward localized production, to put toward retraining and education of people, uh, right here to figure out how to deal with the crisis, um, the local health um, and environmental and ecological crises and linking those to the economic crisis in, in jobs, I think it would make a huge difference. But unfortunately, as you noted, um, you know, these these systems, none of them are working in isolation. I mean, not unfortunately in that sense, but, but it's all of it is, is, is connected and tied together and um, the national uh, determined contributions of Pakistan is essentially a statement that Pakistan is going to continue on its growth path, um, aiming to grow 300 plus percent over the next 20 years and clearly states we need money if we're going to do anything about this. And I think um, the United States re-entering the Paris Agreement hopefully will be um, useful, but it won't be enough. It really, it, it won't be enough. Um, the EU also is talking about a global Green New Deal and there's uh, finance, financial aspects tied to that as well. Um, but I think, um, I, I don't think we can count on leadership anywhere to do what needs to be done. I think it is the movements on the ground that are pushing for the kinds of uh, changes that we need to see. And they, they certainly do need to be international. Great. Um, and something you said brought out another question for me, Tabby. When you talk, when you touch on the role of the U.S. sort of receding from the Paris Agreement, but also actors like China emerging um, with refreshed commitments, however sincere we might think those are. Um, when it comes to the Pakistani context, the next 30, 40 years are looking like they're going to be defined by this project of mega proportions, uh, right? The China-Pakistan economic corridor. Um, and in that sense, given the insane amount of investment in our infrastructure, um, in our in in jobs in job creation etc. How can we leverage the development and growth that is expected to be brought in by a project like CPEC and the sort of connectivity brought in by a, a, wide, a wider initiative like the BRI into redirecting some of those flows of finance towards climate resilience mitigation um, policy 
and how do we reorient our way of thinking about getting finance for infrastructure projects towards actually measuring and uh, gaining some kind of reducing the environmental impact of our economic footprint. Uh, so Tabby or Rafi or Rimmel, um, I think either of you, whoever wants to respond to that, um, it would be great to hear what, you, what your thoughts on that are. I can answer it briefly because the materials available with the Planning Commission of Pakistan on the CPEC uh, do not contain any reference to climate change except one reference where climate change is termed a possibility. In my opinion, uh, CPEC, without considering the impacts of climate change to the ecosystems of the Hindu Kush, Himalayan and Karakoram mountain ranges, is playing, is gambling with nature uh, and, and, and is a potential ecocide. But I was reminded when Tabi was talking about our nationally determined contributions and their projection of 300% increase of greenhouse gas emissions till 2030, uh, thankfully, uh, this particular NDC has remained something on paper, like many of the policies in Pakistan. It hasn't been acted upon. Thankfully, we aren't seeing the greenhouse gas emissions that it envisages. However, under the Paris Agreement, Pakistan and uh, all the other countries' signatories uh, there too are supposed to update their NDCs by the end of 2020. I understand Pakistan is in the process of updating its new uh, contributions, uh, but that process is nowhere near complete. Uh, and also there hasn't been any input from uh, civil society uh, or from any other uh, government agencies in the development of any direction for future direction regarding uh, the updated uh, contributions. And thirdly, I just wanted to say one more thing because I'm reminded by the brilliant points made earlier. We're talking a lot about countries. Uh, although, you know, a lot of climate debate is framed on countries, I think, you know, in many ways, uh, dividing the world into 200 different units and having them fight with one another is hardly a strategy to combat climate change. And instead, what I would do is invite people and their attention to the systems that drive climate change, because it's not just for countries to like the global north to fulfill its obligations. It's beyond that. Let's not talk countries anymore. Uh, leave that for the diplomats and the conference of parties to be able to sort out. But we as individuals have to understand that climate change is caused by systems, the systems of capitalism, patriarchy, the fossil fuel economy and, and consumerism. And let me explain these phrases because I'm not talking necessarily of capitalism as a political uh, uh, ideology. It's a means of the exploitation of resources. And it is capitalism, for example, that yields these asymmetrical results, such as the fact that only 90 companies are responsible for as much as 65% of global greenhouse gas emissions from the Industrial Revolution onwards. It's that exploitation of resources that has been allowed by a system such as capitalism. And the same is true with patriarchy. And I'm not taking necessarily in terms of feminism, but in terms of a means of consumption of resources where the male is at the center of attention, causing, of course, discrimination against women on a systemic level. And then there's consumerism, because this is very important. Climate change is not caused by all of us equally. 10% of the global elite consume 50% of its resources. It's that minority that's responsible, not the vast majority of the population of the earth, which consumes very little because the vast population of the earth is poor, like Pakistan. And that's what I want to draw your attention to, because often it's said that Pakistan is very vulnerable to climate change. Uh, that may be so, but you have to understand why. Uh, we're poor. We don't have the ability to be resilient. You see, unlike other affluent countries. So instead of talking about climate change and what can be done in terms of what countries can do, I would invite people's attention to look at climate change and its impacts on the spectrum of, of social affluence so that we can understand that it's our own behavior when we buy a SUV rather than a used automobile that drives climate change because that's consumption and fossil fuel economy and capitalism as systems driving it. We have to address these systems uh, if we're to address the climate crisis. Sure. Uh, thanks, Rafi. And that would, that actually takes us, I think, to another question is that building off your point, how can we ensure that this transition and this climate action is inclusive and is just and actually benefits and serves the most vulnerable? So 
rural communities, labor, informal settlements, people who are at the front lines of, of climate change? How can we make sure that they are embedded at the heart of any policy action that does take place um, within the system? So, uh, Tabi, do, do you want to respond to that first and then we can go around? Um, sure. And I'll link it to, to your previous question related to CPEC as well, because those investments, uh, as we know, I think about half of the 60, 62, 64 billion uh, dollars that are being invested in CPEC are for energy projects. And the vast majority of those are coal uh, coal-fired power plants and coal mines across this country. And the question is, were any of the people of Thur actually party to the discussions of, you know, the terms of the CPEC agreement? Um, and, and uh, you know, I don't think they were based on reports that I've read and things I've seen. Um, but similarly, I think linking it also to the questions of, of health, um, you know, here in Punjab, we're dealing with the crisis of smog. Um, it also, you know, worsens our susceptibility to viruses and illnesses in general. Um, and we can see the government is trying to take on this crisis, is at least paying lip service to, to, to the issue of, of smog. Um, but the brick kiln workers, for instance, were not part of any discussions, um, to my knowledge, about the brick kilns being shut down for the next two months uh, in the name of, of reducing the smog, uh, the winter smog that, that we're dealing with here. Um, we know that these people are also working in, you know, servitude, they're bonded laborers, they're the most vulnerable of the vulnerable, many of them are, are Christians as well, they're minorities, um, and, uh, you know, they're very concerned, they may not necessarily know very much about the health or scientific aspects, but they, but what I've seen when attending some demonstrations uh, by brick kiln workers concerned about their jobs and livelihoods is that they're, they're now saying, we know that the smog will still be here because all, all of the cars are on the road. So why are you taking our jobs uh, when, 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 you know, there are vehicles on the road every day and, and nothing's being done about that? Um, and so I think uh, it, it doesn't, I mean, there has been this whole discourse about having a seat at the table, providing, you know, access to the conversation. There are, you know, social impact assessments where the, you know, the idea has become to just, you know, check, uh, you know, a box uh, on a forum saying, yes, the people were consulted. But in practice, I don't think that's really the case. And I think if you actually look to the movements on the ground, people are saying, you know, there are certain things that are non-negotiable for us. Our livelihoods are non-negotiable. Um, and that's across the board. People, you know, want, need to be able to make sure that they can put food on the table for their children and keep housing um, and, and all, of, all of the rest of it. And so I think... Um, in a way, we need to flip the narrative and not so much talk about, okay, we are the policy makers or this is the, the space of bureaucrats and once in a while people can be invited to come and, and give their perspective. But I think the, the people on the ground need to be part of making the decisions uh, in their own areas and in the areas that affect their lives from the beginning. Um, so that's what I would say about that. Great. Thank you, Tabi. Um, Rimmel, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, uh, thank you, Asif. I think that uh, Tabi hit the nail on the head because it's really the the checking off the box is is it's also a huge issue with, with the, within the NGO culture as well, where you sort of, you kind of have an idea, okay, you, but there is this sort of, you know, you impose a framework onto these people who have valuable knowledge about their areas. They have valuable insights into their experiences. And unfortunately, we go to them with frameworks and structures that are completely at odds with what they know. And that is, and that causes the exclusion of that insight and 
makes it difficult for the free, active, meaningful, and informed participation of these people within these decisions that have that are being taken. And which have very serious consequences for their lives. And, you know, a hill that I will die on is that Pakistan, unfortunately, and uh, across the global south, does not have a regional vocabulary for climate change. It does not understand it and explain it and communicate it in a way that is localized, that is, that is mindful of what, how unique the situation is to us. And because of that, the political cost of ignoring these communities when it comes to high investment projects like CPEC is very, very low. They can ignore it and it's fine because as long what they're telling people is that we're solving the power crisis and everybody's, everybody's celebrating that because nobody likes load shedding, right? So unfortunately, until enough people are enough people make this a problem and this is something the political cost of ignoring climate change has to go up if you want the MNAs from that region to be the people who have it it should not be like their the participation of their constituents should be non-negotiable for them and that kind of people power is unfortunately not going to happen until we until the, the farmer that is having that whose entire livelihood is completely upended by changing rainfall patterns they can say that, hang on, this is happening to me and you need to do something about this. Mm -hmm. And that's not going to happen until they, they don't know what they're even saying. So that's something that's important. Absolutely. Um, and I just to redirect um, on that point, I think there's also this uh, gulf very often in our society where or the urban debate around climate action is very different from the the debate around it's sort of divorced. The movement is divorced from the issues plaguing the more interior parts of our country, whether that's interior Punjab, interior Sindh. So how do we bridge that gulf and how do we bridge that divide when it comes to our activist communities? How can we ensure that even within these grassroots movements like Climate Action PK um, and the various other organizations that were part of the Climate March last year, how can we ensure that the makeup of these grassroots organizations and movements is more equitable and gives more voice uh, to the people who don't generally have a voice in these conversations. Yeah. Well, I mean, to, to echo what Rimmel was saying, uh, I, in my opinion, one of the problems with developing uh, the climate policy in Pakistan historically was that there were no climate experts that the Ministry of Environment, this is before the 18th Amendment, uh, could reach out to uh, in, within Pakistan. And so perforce they were, you know, the model is you get, uh, funding, you get funding for an international consultant. And so the development of a lot of the environment policy and, and the climate policy uh, came with, with the assistance of, of, of foreign technical assistance. And what that meant was, I mean, most of these reports firstly are in English, and then the dominant discourse that they carry uh, is very rules-based, uh, the UNFCCC, uh, global emission reduction targets, and so on and so forth. That's the sort of language of development speak that you'll get in any NGO or think tank working on the subject in Islamabad or anywhere else. But what's happened since over the last 20 years is that higher educational institutions and now even, you know, uh, uh, secondary education and uh, has environment and uh, civics and also climate change that you can study now at the MSc level. And we not only have graduates with expertise, but now over the years, these people have worked in the field and have their own experience. So if one were to do a climate policy exercise again, all you have to do is put your ear to the ground and listen which is what I would recommend to do if you want to ask anybody about or formulating a climate policy. If Pakistan is one of the most vulnerable countries in, on climate change, just go ask somebody outside what they, uh, how climate change impacts them, and you'll get an answer. It could be because electricity fluctuation. It could be the provision of a non-provision of clean drinking water. It could be, as Tabby said, your employment being knocked out because of an activist high court that's trying to protect clean air. Who knows? But listen to people because they're the ones experiencing climate change and try and develop a narrative that's indigenous first. Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Rafi. Uh, Dabi, Rimmel, do you have any additional things uh, to add to that? Yeah, I'd absolutely echo Rafi's sentiments. You know, I, I recently went to Gilgit, Baltistan, and I met 
uh, the family of Baba John, but I had I had been trying to learn about what happened in Atabad, you know, in uh, almost a decade ago um, when a landslide happened and um, multiple villages were completely inundated because the, the landslide actually blocked the flow of the river and created a lake in that valley. And, um, you know, actually some of Baba John's family lives right here in Lahore and they, they came to last year's climate march and participated in it, uh, the demands of the people of Atabad for compensation and support, you know, for, for a disaster that happened uh, to them, you know, were reflected in the demands um, that were put forward by the uh, Climate Action Pakistan group across Pakistan. And that's just one example, but I, I do agree completely with Rafi that, you know, th I mean, Things are already happening all across this country. People are actively engaged wherever they are. The question is, are, are we listening? Is the media listening? Or is the government listening? Um, if people aren't listening or, or if their voices are, are actively being shut out, why is that happening? And we need to really think very critically uh, and carefully about why that's happening. What are the power relations uh, you know, that, that, that are, are leading to this type of exclusion. Um, so I, I don't know, uh, but it may just be the case that uh, the recent release of all of the climate prisoners who were being detained in GB may have something to do with, with the fact that the climate activists were paying attention, that it wasn't just people in GB whose voices are already being silenced, you know, uh, weren't being um, heard, you know, I mean, were being put forward, but that people were listening across this country. Um, that's just one example, but there, there are, I mean, so many more across this country. Yeah, definitely. Um, and hopefully that's a sign that the more that kind of uh, sort of mobilization of people takes place and affects genuine change, uh, the more these movements will grow and become more inclusive and more reflective of a more collective Pakistani voice and develop that indigenous vocabulary that, that Rafi and Brimal referred to um, as so essential to tackling the climate crisis on a grassroots level. Um, Brimal, would you like to add anything or should we um, move on to one last question, which will be really quick. Um, but Rimmel, before that, you can... Um, I'm more than happy for you to move to the next question. <laughs> so uh, I think we've had a... I think it's been a really interesting discussion. I think some really important points have come through. Um, looking at the climate crisis as a, as a problem of systems, not of individual nations or, or countries or regions, um, because that simplifies it and that prevents us from really thinking about this crisis as a systemic crisis. Um, and one that is more than just the sum of 192 nations and their efforts at doing something. Uh, I think the second thing which was just mentioned is the importance of the localization of climate action, um, which all of you spoke about and the importance of indigenous context and, ind and indigenous vocabulary and system of addressing climate change and voicing demands and voicing grievances. So in light of those two major takeaways, and please feel free to jump in if, if you think there's any further uh, takeaways that need to be highlighted. In the next 10 years, which are really critical uh, for the world to address the climate crisis, what are three things? Um, and I know that's oversimplifying the response required to climate change, uh, but humor me. What are three things that you really think need to be done on a local, governmental, societal level, whatever level, um, to really address the climate crisis from the point of view of a global South nation like Pakistan um, and the people most vulnerable to the effects of climate change. If I can come in, I think that the focus on individual consumption needs to go away because 
it's the it's i feel like it's a tactic of the fossil fuel industry to shift focus and blame people for using their products and pretend they're just sort of innocent providers of what the public demands um i think and fossil fuel subsidies need to end and i think the technical assistant and assistance and technological transfer of uh, of of that assistance needs to be done very quickly from the global north to the south but that was me humoring you so <laughs> thank you appreciate it uh great tabby uh, great question this is the question of our time um i i really think we need to be having conversations about what kind of real alternatives are available to us there's a lot of greenwashing there are a lot of false narratives even coming straight out of the un coming out of joe biden's climate plan right now uh the idea that certain technologies um are going to save us certain kinds of geoengineering or or market solutions are going to save us and that we don't really have to do anything about it we just let the the scientists and the economists handle it is isn't realistic what's realistic is that we are going to imagine real alternatives and th- those are you know those those discussions are in the making i think we need to focus on food systems um food sovereignty uh and seed sovereignty that is putting food into the hands of people moving away from the commodification of seeds and uh, food um i think we need to as remo was saying pull completely out of uh subsidizing fossil fuels um and i think we need to talk about meaningful uh transportation like real transportation alternatives um that don't rely on on technologies that are going to require dispossessing people to get the you know the resources from under their land um so these are the areas i think we need to focus on and and as this entire discussion has emphasized i really think it needs to be a, a broad society wide conversation it can't be something that is left to the technocrats absolutely thanks tabby so so far we've had and fossil fuel subsidies um enhanced technology transfer technical assistance and greenwashing uh have systemic society wide transformations explore transportation alternatives so rafael what are, what what do you have to add to that list wow Usually I dismiss these sort of questions by saying if I had the answer to this sort of stuff I wouldn't be on this particular panel. But good question and I have three thoughts that I'd like to share uh that I'd like to add to uh, Rimmel and and Tabby's comments. The first is I think we're going to start seeing the emergence of a new morality. You know just as in the last 30 years uh there's been a generational shift in attitude towards smoking. We're going to see a generational shift in attitude towards uh consumption and uh, greenhouse gas emissions and it may manifest itself differently but it is going to be a new morality and it's going to coincide uh, as we're seeing today with the collapse of many well established systems on account of climate change the weather systems are already collapsing and uh, scarcity of resources is putting political regimes around the world under stress as well and we're beginning to see the rise of these global strongmen and so as these systems collapse systems that we thought would last like uh, liberal democracy for example as these systems collapse as food systems also collapse as agriculture collapses uh, as society collapses i think within this new morality one of the most important things values uh, i feel we need to have is empathy because it's the connection with other human beings that will remain most important in a world where systems that we rely upon are falling apart the second is that i think we need very urgently the uh, a discourse of the global south i'm both impressed and awed by the momentum the personality of greta thunberg could develop around the climate crisis over such a short period of time but that discourse you uh, with my appreciation you know and respect is very much the discourse of the global north of the consumer I would like to see the emergence of a discourse on climate change by the global affected. I think that's necessary. And thirdly, listening to Tabi's story about Baba Jan, one of Pakistan's 
uh, and I hope we won't see any more climate, uh, politic, uh, climate uh, prisoners, we can begin to connect civil society uh, activism on climate and environment with civic activism in cities around the world uh, within the field of understanding of political ecologies. And I think this is something we need to develop in Pakistan, an understanding of how all these community fights. For example, a few months ago, uh, one of the planned billion tree uh, tsunami initiatives in the erstwhile Fata area was vigorously opposed by locals who felt it was an assault on their properties and on their tribal traditions. But at the same time, intricately linked uh, to climate change. And we're going to have to begin to understand the connection each one of these seemingly disparate movements has to the climate crisis. And it's synthesizing that, understanding that all of these things are connected that will hopefully move the momentum uh, on the climate action forward. Excellent. Uh, I think we've come away with a great list. Um, my question, thank you all for making yourselves available today. I think it's been a really, really interesting discussion. Uh, and I'm always, I always feel privileged uh, to be able to have these kinds of conversations um, with people who feel as strongly about, at, about this subject. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you to everyone who's been watching. And we hope this has been an interesting and um, inspiring conversation on some level for you. So thank you again to the UCP team. Thank you to Rafi. Thank you to Tabi. Thank you to Rimmel. And have a good night, everyone.